Hey everyone, and welcome to this video. My name is Christian from Beyond Premiere, and things just got real in episode 5 of Shogun. Blackthorn tries to play the gracious host at Drunk Samurai Showdown and a dead gardener on his hands. Talk about a rough night. First off, can we take a moment to appreciate the symbolism in this episode? From the importance of words to the careful arrangement of rocks in the garden, everything has deeper meaning. Even that poor peasant becomes a metaphor. But the real drama comes from the surprise return of Mariko, not so dead husband, Monturo. This guy crashed the world's most awkward dinner party and proceeds to get wasted, shoot arrows at his wife, and generally be a massive... <laughs> Blackthorn steps in to defend Miracle's honor, but she's not having any of his white knight. She drops some hard truth about duty and sacrifice that leave our bold English pilot questioning everything. And there's a whole fiasco with the peasant. Blackthorn attempts at a cultural exchange backfire as spectacularly when Ujuro, the early gardener, winds up dead for trying to get rid of the stinking bird. It's a brutal lesson in Japanese costumes and the deadly price of disobedience. But just when you think things cannot get any worse, bam, a massive earthquake hits. Throwing everything into chaos in the aftermath, Toronaga enemies are circling like vultures with the cunning Lady Oshiva ready to make her move. Episode 5 has a lot of hidden agendas, shifting alliances, and the looming specter of war. The lines between friend and foe are close and no one is safe. Alright, so let's dive deeper into the storm that was episode 5. First up, we got the dinner party from hell. Blackthorn pulls out of these stops, whipping up some classic English rabbit stew. But apparently his themed samurai guests are too good for his foreign cooking. Bontoro straight up refused to eat, making a big show of how particular their tastes are. I mean, come on, <laughs> read the room. But the real kicker comes when Bontoro decides to turn the dinner table into a freaking archery range. He's all like, hey, Blackthorn, pick a post, I'm gonna shoot it. And despite miracle warnings, our pilot chooses her one right in front of her. It was a nice move. Bontoro proceeds to get chip face on Sake and nearly kill his wife with some seriously sloppy shooting. That's when things go from bad to worse. Bontoro flip his. Going full abusive husband mode, this is later. He's screaming at Mariko, manhandling her, and just being an all around prick. But Blackthorn is not just about standing by and watch. He chased after Bontoro, ready to throw down and defend Mariko's honor. Too bad he feels too much like a coward and blames it on Sake to face him like a man. Later, Blackthorn tries to talk some sense into Mariko, telling her she doesn't have to put up with Bontoro. But Mariko shuts him down with some harsh realities about duty and sacrifice. She's not looking for a savior and she sure as hell doesn't need Blackthorn pity. This is a woman who's been through some serious trauma and she got her own way of dealing with it. Which brings us to the whole mess with the peasant. Blackthorn attempt at cultural exchange goes wrong when the bird is moved. And hey, the old gardener ends up dead for trying to dispose of the bird. See, Blackthorn made his big deal about no one touching this. If they move it, it will mean dead. Not realizing his words we take in as law. Hey, poor Ujuro was just trying to keep the peace, but he paid the ultimate price for his disobedience. It's a devastating blow for Blackthorn, who's already struggling to navigate the complex web of Japanese costumes and politics. He's realizing that his words carry more weight than he ever imagined and that even the smallest actions can have deadly consequences in this unfamiliar land. But the real gut punch comes at the end of the episode when a massive earthquake strikes. The village is left in ruins and Blackthorn own house is wrecked. In the middle of all this chaos, he finds he goes to the rocks in the garden, watching him rearrange them. You can see the weight of his guilt and the dawning realization that he's in way over his head. Meanwhile, back in Osaka, Toranaga enemies are plotting their next move. The Council of Regents is in shambles, and Lady Oshiva is ready to swoop in 
and take control. That she's not up to no good. And with Toronaga occupied with the earthquake aftermath, the timing could not be better for a power grab. Now something also in the episode is the whole gardener subplot takes on a whole new meaning when you realize there's a spy lurking in the shadows and he's getting blamed for being the mole. We know who it is and that's even better realization of who he is and why. It's a classic misdirection tactic. While everyone's busy pointing fingers at the dead gardener, the real spy is still out there bidding information to Toronaga enemies. Even though the Gardener storyline may seem like a minor subplot, but it's actually a crucial piece of the larger puzzle. It shows how deception and betrayal are connected into the very fabric of this society. But now Muraji has been flying under the radar this whole time. But he's the real spy feeding information to Toranaga and talk about a plot twist. See while everyone else is running around like headless chickens trying to figure out who it is. Muraji is just chilling in the background gathering intel like a pro. He's got the perfect cover. Who's gonna suspect a humble fisherman of being a secret agent? It's genius. But here's the best part. Toronaga is not just using Moriji to keep tabs on his enemies, he's also using him to feed false information and throw everyone off the scent. It's like a giant game of telephone with Moraji whispering into one ear and Toronaga pulling the strings from afar. And the crazy thing is, he's not just some random spy, he's actually a samurai in disguise. One of Toronaga's most trusted retainers. But it just goes to show how deep the deception runs in this world. And let's not forget his intel is what's keeping Taranaga one step ahead of his enemies. Now real quick, let's talk about the twisted love story that is Mariko and Bontoro. These two have a relationship that's more complicated than a Game of Thrones family tree. And episode 5 just peels back another layer of their messed up dynamic. On the surface, Bunturo seems like your typical abusive, controlling husband. He's always putting Mariko down, flaunting his power over her, and generally being a grade A ah. <laughs> but according to the show creators, there's more to this guy than meets the eye. Apparently beneath all the macho men, <laughs> Bunturo actually loves Mariko, like truly, truly, madly, deeply loves her. And it's hard to wrap your head around this, considering the way he treats her. But that's the thing, Bunturo love is so intense, so all-consuming, that it's actually his greatest weakness. He's so desperate to keep Mariko close to protect her from the world, that he ends up suffocating her in the process. And the crazy thing is, Mariko knows all of this. It's a tragic situation, one that speaks to the harsh realities of being a woman in this brutal world. Mariko is just as much as a prisoner as a Blackthorn, maybe even more so. At least, at least he has the hope of escape, of returning to his ship and his crew. But she's bound by the unbreakable chains of tradition and honor. Okay, now, did you catch that about the white arrows in the house? That's some seriously spooky symbolism right there. Apparently in Japanese culture, if your house gets hit with white arrows, it means you're straight up cursed. Talk about bad juju. And guess what Bontaro does during that insane dinner scene? He shoots not one, but two arrows right into the pillar of Black, of Black Thorn's house. Coincidence? I think not. According to M Mako, the consultant producer, when Japanese viewers see that, they instantly know this place is doomed. It's like a giant cosmic from the universe. But here's the thing, I don't think Bontaro was just showing off his mad skills. Sure, he's got a reputation as a master bowman, but I think there's more to it than that. What if, on some subconscious level, he wanted to curse Blackthorn's house? He hates the guy, resents him for shaking up his wife, and probably blames him for all the dysfunction. Maybe, that's just my theory. But hey, this is just how the next day there's an earthquake. But talk about a reality check. Blackthorn wakes up to find his whole world turned upside down, literally. His house is trash, his garden is a mess, and poor Fuji's been hurt in the chaos. But in all the destruction, there's this really important moment with the rock garden. 
Remember how the gardener was always going on about the importance of rocks, how they were the foundation of the garden? Well, after the earthquake, those carefully arranged stones are scattered all over the place. It's like a metaphor of Black Thorn's entire existence. Everything he knew, everything he thought he knew, all the plants he had just got thrown in total disarray. And what does he does? He rolls up his leaves and start putting one of those rocks back into place. This has so meaning, so much meaning, and it speaks volume about his mindset. He's not just fixing a garden, he's trying to regain some sense of control to find order in the chaos. This is a sign that Blackthorn is trying to adapt to observe the lessons of this strange new land. He's beginning to understand that there's wisdom and these customs that maybe, just maybe, the Japanese way of doing things as meaning. It's not a total transformation, but hey, Blackthorn still got a lot to learn. Now in the earthquake, the ground is shaking, buildings are breaking. This is when Blackthorn wants to leave with his ship. And this is when we see the destruction of the town. He this is when he sees on a mission, he sees Toronaga disappear under the pile of the breeze and doesn't hesitate for a second. He dives right in, risking his life and limb to dig the man out. And when he finally puts Toronaga free, what does our noble samurai lord do? He laughs. He laughs like he just heard the words on his jokes. Why? Because in the, this is the meaning of as well of the scene, Blackthorn gives the sword to Toronaga. And this is not just a random act, of generosity is a statement he's basically saying he's saying hey remember those those swords Mariko told me were worthless well guess what i'm giving you them to you and toronaga knows what blackthorn is doing obviously this blaze with new meaning simply the act of giving them is a power move a way for blackthorn to assert his place in this world and his growing understanding of Japanese culture. Remember, the same way that words have meaning, now what he did has also meaning. And if you know the story of the swords, they didn't have a lot of big meaning. So it's a subtle shift, but a significant one. But that's my breakdown of this episode. There's a lot of meaning I will discuss in separate videos. But thank you so much for watching. My name is Christian from BM Premiere, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye, one.